What's happening, y'all? Welcome back to part two of Stay in College, subtitled Nobody Wants You Till You Don't Need Them. We're going to read the rest of the essay. Um, so if you haven't watched part one, you're going to definitely want to go back and check that out. It's linked below. Listening to Joey D. Francesco. Very little editing, no editing. We're just going over, you know, a field guide, if you will, for how to survive in the music industry. For mid-level bands, you know, not, this isn't for like superstars. All right, so where did we leave off? All right, I know where we left off. Nobody wants you until you don't need them. Waiting for Joey D to kick in that groove. Archive.org. Got him. Hey, little old Ray Charles. All right. Nobody wants you till you don't need them. Get my mic right. This was the single most important, miserable, frustrating, empowering thing I have ever learned about most of this business. Here's a list of people who, for the most part, don't want you until you don't really need them. <laughs> One, record labels. Two, booking agents. Three, managers. Four, festivals and clubs. So I'm about to expand on that one more time. I want to remind you, go back and watch part one, right? You're going to need part one to understand what's happening in part two. I didn't want to put them all on one video. I didn't want it to be two hours long. Record labels. Now, I wrote this back in 2007. If you're still here without watching part one, right? This is old. This is old. So they're going to expand on this. Record labels. <clears throat> Let me explain. Again, this is a business. What business wants to invest their time and money into a product that has little or no proven monetary return? What label wants to spend thousands or millions of do dollars on an artist that no one has heard of that hasn't sold any records on their own, that has no track record of real touring yet? Well, you may be thinking of few that have, do, or will. They do exist, but only for one in a million artists. You may offer me now the classic Britney Spears equation or whatever you would or whatever, and you would be right to do so. However, this is not trying to solve your problem. If you want to be the next Britney, forget everything I have said and stop reading because you'll probably just have to meet the right person at the right time. But if you want to be the next Jason Ritchie, I don't know why you would, or even better, the next Stevie Ray Vaughan or David Matthews, Dave Matthews, listen up. I have some ideas you should consider. Now, first of all, I think I was wrong here. I, don't, I think Britney more or less clawed her way to the top. I, I don't know, right? But I think that might have been wrong. Okay. <clears throat> we all know much of today's music has little sincerity. I'm talking about pop music. Little substance, little originality, and in some cases, very few actually played, not programmed, musical instruments. True. Get over it. <laughs> People say, we're going to see a band tonight, not hear one. Most people think slash thought Britney looked good. Most pop stars look good. It's just a fact. Giant record companies today can literally place almost any good looking person slash people in the spotlight and with the right amount of money and timing market this person overnight as a hit until within weeks they often are. It's not the record company's fault. True, they usually dispose of the said star in a year or two in favor of some newer model whose voice and or look resembles that of whatever rivals artist single is trend setting number one slot whatever rival artist single is trend setting setting the number one slot on the billboard charts but it is done in a simple supply and demand fashion every day the pop charts are usually just a conveyor belt of virtual prefabricated market proven cliches disguised as melodies, lyrics, and beats that the average person can listen to <laughs> while talking on their cell phone and following their GPS navigation system to work. Wow, was I jaded. Still a little bit. Not quite as bad now as I was back then. <laughs> what music is cool? 
is whatever they tell us is cool. And if we buy it, we tell them back, you were right. So let's stop blaming them and get proactive in our own lives for a minute. Speaking of proactive, in the truly eloquent words of P. Diddy from the proactive acne cream commercial, let us moisturize our situation. (laughs) That's pretty funny. Get out there and sell some records. Be sure you keep track and can prove how many you sold too. I need to be better about that. Today, I've slacked off of that today. I've gotten a little lackadaisical, you know. I'm about that. I think I'm, you know, not trying as hard as I used to try when I was younger, right? I got to, it's good for me to read this too, right? All right, wait, 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 wait. Uh, Get out there and sell some records. Be sure you keep track and can prove how many you sold too. Even small numbers, thousands will impress small and some larger record companies out there. They want to make money. If you can prove to them that good music will make good money, all the better. But most of the time, that burden lies on you. Dave Matthews, Fish, and Blues Travelers had thousands of fans, gigs, and sold records under their belts before they ever had a solid deal in a lawyer's office. Don't expect God or Sony to answer your major label prayers overnight based on the fact that you've been doing this for 50 years or that you're only 19 years old and play better than Stevie Ray. Or that everyone at the local open mic in Kalamazoo, Michigan tells you you're so much better than whatever person they heard on the radio. Faith without works is dead and you'll need both where you're going. Excuses are usually just excuses. You will need gigs, though. Here's how to get them. You will need both where you're going. That's the truth. You will need faith and works. Clubs and festivals. Remember, nobody wants you until you don't need them. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. There's that word again. You will not get the money the big bands at those clubs or festivals get your first, fifth, or sometimes 20th time in the door. If you don't get people out. Asses in the seats is what they call it. In the biz, we call it asses in the seats. You will have to make the best CD you can with whatever budget you have, put it in a folder with an 8x10 photo and any press awards you have managed to get so far and mail them to all the clubs in your target tour area. Now that That's before now. Now we have electronic press kits, right? You don't even have to do that. But it's not a bad idea to still do that, right? I'll tell you why, right? If a club gets your CD, right, and they throw it in the garbage, and then they get another one or they get a phone call, sometimes they'll go, oh, I've heard of that person. I don't know where, but I've heard of them. And it's because you sent them a CD that they threw in the garbage and forgot about, but they kind of remembered the name. All right, I used to put candy bars in my press packs. That would, you know, like get, oh, this one comes with a candy bar, right? (laughs) Anything, right? You know, all right, uh, let's see. (laughs) I forgot about that. There are various, uh, oh yeah, okay. Then you will have to call the club on the right day. Know the club owner's name. That's important. Know their name. There are various magazines, books, websites out there that have radio, TV, club, festival, press info on them for every state in the U.S., Some even tell you the capacity of the club, type of music usually booked, and time to call. Get those. I don't know if they still have them. It was called The Musician's Touring, The Musician's Guide to Touring and Promotion. And it used to come out once a year. It was like 40 bucks or something back then. It was a magazine. Um, And now I'm sure there's websites for all that, right? But anyway. Um... Get those, meaning those magazines or on those websites, right? Once you get the club owner on the phone, don't be insulted if he has never heard of you or has listened to your music. You may have to call at the right time every Tuesday for six months or more and send multiple press kits before they ever listen to your CD. That's true. It says they are not arrogant. Most aren't. Just busy. And there are thousands of you compared to hundreds, if that, of them. And less now. More of us and less of them. Be patient, persistent, polite. You may have to find another venue in the same town who will book you, then approach the better club later after you have built an audience. Again, name dropping will get you nowhere. What good is it if the club you are best buds with, it, it, wait, wait, what good is it if you are best buds with Walter Trout if no one has ever heard of you? If you, are really, if you really are best buds with a band that does well at the club, 
call them and ask them to put a good word in for you. I have a few friends I help out this way all the time because they help themselves. I do that. I still do that. I'll do that with you guys, with the harmonica guys. If you guys ask me the right question, I can't help but answer it because I've been there with the same question and I can't help it. I got to answer it. It's like, it just, yeah, it kills me. I'm like, oh man, this guy is doing it. He's doing the work. He's asking, well, you know, what's the major third of the five chord? I'm in, I'm in. All right, all right, let's see. Where, where was I? Where was I? If you really are, yeah, all right, all right. Um, you are not asking for the world or even the gig just for your friend to say that dude can play. Still, your money will be low at first. You will have to take th this money and like it for a while <laughs> until you're better known. As you do better, be sure you up your money appropriately so you don't get stuck at that price or deter actual booking agencies from becoming interested in you. Remember this excuse from earlier. My Remember I told you, if you go back to part one, in part one, I gave a bunch of excuses about why they somebody can't make it as a musician, and now I'm dispelling them. Some of them I dispelled right away. Some of them got dispelled before I put them out, and then some of them are going to get are going to get handled now. Okay, so as uh, where was I? Sorry. As you do better, be sure you up your money appropriately so you don't get stuck at the price or deter actual booking agents from becoming interested. And you remember this excuse from earlier: my band members all have regular jobs and won't leave town. Book the gigs first then find the players. This way you have money to offer them instead of far-fetched plans and dreams. You know how many times I've heard, um, oh man, I'm going to get this band together and we're going to do this, man. It's going to be great, right? And nothing ever happens. You come to me and you say, look, I got a week worth of dates going up to Iowa. You know, I'm not sure what it pays, but this is the bare minimum, you know. We, are you interested? Sure, let's talk, right? That's how it is. Uh, this way you have money to offer them instead of far-fetched plans and dreams. Why should anyone hop in a van with you, leave their husband, wife, job, cat, dog, or ferret behind with some kind, without some kind of pay agreement? If the club asks you, is this the same band you have on the CD you sent, you lie and say yes and explain after the gig. <laughs> or you can say mostly if you can match even one guy. <laughs> I don't usually condone dishonesty. I don't ever, but we don't ask the club what waitresses they've hired or if they have the same bartender as the last time we do. We find the best players you can. You find the best players you can. Reliable, nice guys are often better than talented, difficult ones. Whoa, it's true. That's what we talked about earlier. Don't be an asshole, right? If you got the gigs, the players will come. Generally, the better the money you're making, the better your band. You may have to find some kids with not a whole lot going on to back you up as your buddy Joe, who plays bass like George Porter, isn't likely to give up his dentist gig to make $350 a week with you the first year till you guys hit it big, $500 a week. <laughs> you hire whom you can until the right players fall in place. And if someone leaves you, keep going. Just keep going. <clears throat> There's an amazing amount of bands looking for great players out there that are actually working and vice versa be one. It helps to book the bigger money gigs, whatever those may be, first, then the smaller ones. We call the big dates, festivals, private parties, high paying clubs on weekends, etc. Anchor dates. That's what we call them. Get those first and do your best to fill in the weekdays or empty slots. You may have to stay with friends, fans, drive overnight or sleep in shitty hotels along the way. Some of your band members will quit because of this eventually. Don't give up. There's more guys out there, but do your best to keep your boys happy. On some tours, or girls, on some tours, or in the beginning of your band's formation, it is, un it is not uncommon and should be expected that after gas, hotels, van repairs, that your sidemen will actually make more money than the band leader. Oh, man, I'm 30 years into it. That still happens on a lot of tours. But what do I have? I have my name on the marquee. Well, what, was that just for ego? No. No, look, I, I went to prison, right? I, I, I've, I've gone to rehab several times, took a time off, and then what, what can I do? I can just start back up and work. Why? Because I have a name. The, the bass player, drummer, they don't get that name. That, that's money. That's money, having the name on the marquee. That's what that is. 
it, and it's and it's and it's it's the ability to start and stop whenever you want to, right? It's huge. It's really, really big, right? So that's the other thing, man. It might not be in here, but if you're starting a band, put your name in the front. If you're doing the work, don't call it the, you know, the 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 flying ferrets. You know, you call it Mike Jones and the flying ferrets, or you know, something like that, right? Uh, where was I? Oh, right there, right there. Listen, I'm about to say that. Um, your payoff is your name on the marquee, in the papers, on the record cover, in the ads, etc. Eventually, you will earn more, if not much more than them. You are building a reputation and making your name nationally. This is more important than money. In the long run, it actually translates to money. That's what I was saying. Addition, I should have just not talked and kept reading. Additionally, this is really... Just job security is you can quit playing for five years and come back and many folks will remember you. This is not an easy task for sidemen. There can only be one boss when it comes to the money. Tell your boys what you will pay them ahead of time so you won't argue later. If there is extra and you can afford to give them more or buy them dinner, etc., do it. Don't let your biz be a democracy. This is a hard one for me. I struggle with this. Everything else can be, but not the money. I'm I'm, in my older days, I'm thinking that less can be a democracy. So pick up the phone, keep track of who you called, how many times and when. Don't get discouraged. Be patient, persistent. Let the clubs know how much you love them and how cool they are. You need them more than they need you. Expect to put in eight hours or more a day on the phone or the computer. That's, all, that, that's real. I did that. I did that. Eight hours a day calling clubs. Eight hours a day calling festivals. Eight hours a day emailing blue societies. Writing stuff, right? That's what I did for years. Years. It's smart when you start planning to put your band on the road to sock away a bunch of money. Booking, managing, and promoting your band in the beginning and later is a full-time job. If you already have a day gig, save money, then quit it. Treat your new job, booking, managing, and promoting your band like your old one. Get up early, same time you would go to go, go to work, and go to work. It may take you three to six months to book a year worth of tours, and you'll still be filling in the gaps along the way while driving from gig to gig. Starting to understand that word sacrifice yet? Most of your favorite working bands went through some form of this if not the exact formula long before they ever had a booking agent handling them full time. Some people have trust funds or money coming from somewhere or their dad or mom was or is a famous musician or or record label employee, A&R person, and then they bypass this road. Good for them. I want to know that I earned it. It says, uh, exact quote is, I want to know I earned my place. I earned my place. Might not be the greatest place. (laughs) I've done a lot to mess up that place. But I did everything that I just said right there. Next topic, booking agents. Don't forget, nobody wants you till you don't need them. After you get your band on the road and making money all by yourself, all the, well, a few booking agents you sent your package to and bugged and bugged to help book you will suddenly and magically start calling and emailing out of the woodwork. That's right. As soon as you have all the gigs, they're going to want you. Why? Because you don't need them now. Because now you are competing with them for money. The agents are trying to book their bands in the clubs and finding out you already have the date. After an agency agent has called a few clubs a few times and found out you were playing there over and over and over again, you will gain their attention a little. You will really get their attention a lot when they find out you are making as much or more money than some, most, or all of their artists. So why would you even hire these guys? Why even get a booking agency? Why? If you're doing it all yourself and you're making more money, you're not giving away a percentage, why? Why? Two words, mental health. Eight hours a day on the phone, like I said earlier, is too much. It's too much. You have no time to practice. No time to rest. Art imitates life. We need to have a life. For a little while, though, you got to make the sacrifice and not have a life. Okay, let's. Keep, I'm probably saying stuff I'm going to write. I'm going to read this here. The guys will lighten your load, hopefully. 
If they are talented, they will book you in more places than you have been able to do for yourself for more money. Ultimately, if this is the case, you will work less for more money, enjoy better travel, routing. <laughs> yeah, right. I was wrong about that. No longer have to send posters and contracts yourself. Don't have to do that. And be able to focus more on your music and life outside, which is how all this shit started anyway, right? Managers. Nobody wants you until you don't need them. So now that you got the man on the road, maybe you got an agent or two working for you. You find yourself playing the same old clubs over and over to the same old crowds, maybe a little bigger here, there, maybe a little more money here or there, but basically you're tired and feel like you're spinning your wheels. Woo! Your friends at home are saying, hey, I make more than you playing weekends and doing acoustic shit during the week, subbing out for so-and-so and giving lessons, and they're right. They're right. Okay. Where was I? What happened to that making a name part of this equation? Well, first, it takes time. Second, you will plateau here and there. And, and, and third, here's the who you know part, the manager. The manager knows the labels, the PR people, and the booking agents. They will help you now to work smarter instead of harder since you have proven you can do the latter. The manager wants you because you are a tested whole, or a tested worthwhile art artist and more important financial investment so why don't you need so so why don't why do you need them you or why don't you need them you don't need them because you already have everything in place that matters to attract the investors record label agency etc you an interest you want not you want not need them because it saves you time not money in getting your foot in the door believe it or not many record labels are actually pretty out of touch slash clueless to who is doing well making money, selling records, touring, etc. Well, now there's less record companies. So, you know, that this whole record company thing might not even apply anymore at all. I think it still does in the blues a little, but anyway, let's keep going. <clears throat> you have already written them a million times politely explaining this, but the manager's name and word comes with solid clout or comes with some clout and experience. Managers can be great and they can be terrible. Obviously, some kind of pro bono agreement is the best road here. The second best would be a small percentage, say 5 to 10%. We, 10% uh, of the band's total earnings. Yours. Your total earn earnings, not the side man's. That's, that's what Kate and I do, right? After you get the manager, they can be a wonderful and effective liaison between you, the label, the agency, between your band and you, or the world at large. They can help guide the record company agent and you to make smarter decisions concerning your music, money, time, and travel. If you do not have a label or a booking agency, lots of gigs, or a band yet, you really have no need at all for a manager as they have nothing to manage for you. Right? You don't need them. <laughs> you need stuff to manage. We currently have no management. I do now have management, but back then I didn't, apparently. Many successful bands do not. It all comes down to how well you know your business, how much time you have, and how good you are with people skills. So to wrap things up, I hope you have learned nobody wants you until you don't need them. I hope you have seen how this can be a wonderful and empowering thing, empowering thing as well. When you take control, no one can ever say uh, no to your career, which most people will until you do. Wait, what the heck does that mean? When you take control, no one can ever say no to your career, which most people will until you... I don't know what that means. The next time someone says, I don't like your CD, you can ask them, do you like money? Right? They may still not want you, but someone else will. Art is subjective to most people. Money and Don't let them tell you what to play, what is cool, what sells, play your own music, whatever that is. If your band rocks, then learn to, to rock at selling it so you don't have to wait for that golden opportunity, the brass ring, or the right place at the right time crap. Make it happen, at least in the meantime, until you meet that one dude willing to put enough money into you to guarantee your undeserved overnight commercial success. <laughs> sarcasm. Sarcasm, Jason. Keep your integrity. Learn the business. It's mostly logic and common sense with a vague sense of reality. Wow. There are a lot of thieves and sharks out there too. Don't get excited by big sounding offers. This is so hard. Do read carefully or have your lawyer friend explain things to you so you know just exactly how you are getting fucked. <clears throat> That's it. In closing, I would like to say success is subjective as art is. What do you want from this business? 
If you want to play heavy metal style and amplifies nose flute with a polka band and crossover to the pop charts so you can do a duet with 50 Cent on The Tonight Show, you may have to wait until the pop charts cater to heavy metal style amplified nose flute with polka bands. If you just want to play heavy metal style amplified nose flute with a polka band and make a buck here and there, you can probably do, do so using this formula I gave you in this article. <clears throat> it is sad that sincere, soulful, and intelligent music rarely makes lots of money. And that is a fact. But most sincere, soulful, and intelligent uh, musicians realize that this is somewhere, this, this somewhere, realize this somewhere along the yellow brick road that co and come to terms with the fact that they would rather play great music than make great money. But if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You know what I mean? There's no, I, don't, I don't judge, right? You know, if you just if you give, give people what they want. I, I don't do that. I don't do enough of it, right? You know, it's part of the reason. Right. Like I, I, you know, I wrote songs like broken toy, you know, that's a song like that is only going to cater to certain groups of people. The entire album approved by snakes, right? Not everybody's going to like that. As a matter of fact, a lot of people are going to hate it. They're going to really dislike it. I, I dislike it sometimes. No. I'm not talking about the, 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 the musicians or the music. I'm talking about the, the, what it's about. It's tough. It's rough. It's asking a lot of the listener. It was asking a lot of me to play that record every night. Um, I believe there will be an audience for sincere, soulful, intelligent music, and thus there will always be some money, just often not enough of it. Yep. This is why we end up holding benefits for great players with long careers and influences that stretch decades or centuries beyond their, their lives just to raise money for their medical bills or funerals. Just did that for Walter Wolfman Washington. Breaks my heart. Just even saying that breaks my heart. Uh, if you don't know who Walter Wolfman Washington is, man, just Google and get ready. You know, greatest blues musician ever. One of them. Right up there with Gatemouth. Right up there with B.B. King. Right up there with Ray Charles or Johnny Guitar Watson. You know? I have known a few players like that, and I can tell you they wouldn't have done it any other way. <laughs> The reward that comes with doing what you want with your life, the way you want to do it, far surpasses the rewards that money and commercial success can, can offer, however nice. I believe you can take those rewards to the next life with you, unlike the money, however nice. For me, the first real success was when my hearers told me they liked my music and playing. And I knew they meant it. I really succeeded the day I woke up and didn't care if they liked it or not. Wow. I, I care a little, but in the end, if I know it's good, I know it's good. And then I didn't mention a bunch of bands that were out there doing it. And anyway, that's the article, right, guys? Sorry, I a little choked up. Just lost Joey D last year, too. Um, yeah, it's, what, what are your motives, right? What are your motives? What do we do this? Do we do, you know, back then, I'm going to be honest with you. When I wrote that, my motives were nothing. Okay, look, I was into making good music or making music that I thought was real, okay? But really, what I wanted was success. That's what I wanted. And I was sure I was on that path, you know? And the funny thing is, is when I got a little bit more than what I had at the time that I wrote that, I realized it wasn't enough and one you know or, or that I just wanted more that it would never be enough you know I just want to say that it doesn't matter if you want to do this with your life or not I want you to be content and happy and uh, music is you know musician is not who I am okay it's what I do guys it's what I do I remember in the movie Bird directed by Clint Eastwood about Charlie Parker there's a scene in that movie where his wife, Chan, is having a discussion with the head of the mental institute. I think it's supposed to be Bellevue in New York. She's trying to get her husband out of the mental institution, and the guy is maybe going to agree but wants to put him on certain medication. They already hit him with shock therapy and shit like that. And, she, and he's saying, look, I need to put him on this medication, and she's saying, will that medication affect his ability to improvise as a musician. And uh, 
the doctor says, do you want a husband or a musician? And Chan, Charlie's wife, Bird's wife, says they do not separate. Well, I used to hang on to that, that sentence, they do not separate. Me, the harmonica player, Jason, the career, Jason, the musician. And it almost killed me. It almost killed me. Because this is going to have ups and downs, guys. And they're going to be dramatic ups and downs. Our life and what we do, whether it's music or anything, is going to have ups and downs. And if you put your identity as anything other than, I'll say for me, a child of God, anything other than that, musician, husband, father, carpenter, whatever it is, it's going to let you down. It's going to let you down. Or it's going to pa- they're going to pass away. They're going to die. Uh, things are in this world uh, come and go. And we need something. Tom Waits said, if you don't like the whole God thing, I get it. Right? I get it. Right? Tom Waits said, always keep a diamond in your mind. That's what I'm saying. You were that diamond. Keep that diamond whole. Whatever it is you're going through right now, don't let that get to you. It's okay to be hurt by the things we love. It's okay. It's okay to take a hit, to take a punch. It's how we get back up that matters, right? We all know that. We've heard all the cliches, right? But don't make it so that that punch kills you. That don't make it so that you feel worthless because something isn't working out in your life the way you wanted it to. I can tell you after reading this all these years, that the, all the beauty in this has been in the struggle. And there's so many things in that article that I would later go on to mess up and do, and do wrong, right? And there's so many things that are not in this article, like the stuff that I'm telling you right now. The stuff that I'm telling you right now. <sighs> Mem Shannon said to me, today, today, He said, you got to value yourself or nobody else will, right? That can mean ignoring everything that I just said and staying home. If that's too much for you and you don't want to do this, that's okay. You know what? There's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't have all the answers. That's just what I wrote in 2007. I thought it would be fun to revisit it. I think there's a lot of important stuff in there about accountability, right? About like, what can I do to improve my situation rather than complaining about the state of the music business? Candy Kane, the great blues singer, she was a porn star turned blues singer. She said nothing in the porno business prepared me for the sleaze of the music industry. This is a cutthroat, rotten, world that I've only begun to scratch the surface of. At least the blues world is pretty pretty nice to its artists. Less competitive, more of a family situation. But I've seen a little bit of the pop world. I've seen some of the reptilians. I've been at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Not all of them are bad guys. But I know I know what the vampires look like down in Reseda. I met them. <laughs> don't have it in me. Used to wish I did. Used to wish I could be a sociopath, so to speak, so that I could execute business with the best of them. But guess what? I can't. I care about people. I care about myself. And in the end, that's going to matter more to me. That eternal reward, ladies and gentlemen, whatever that is, whether you believe in it or not, how I sleep at night matters more to me than what's in my bank account or what rank I am on the billboard charts. I hope I can keep it that way. It's a struggle, right? It's temptation. It's like being a it's like being an overeaters anonymous. You got to eat, right? You got to eat, right? But you can't eat too much. You know, drug addicts and alcoholics, we got it easy. We can just quit doing drugs and alcohol. People with, you know, sex obsessions or, or sex addictions or food addictions, right? You got to still eat. You got to still behave in that manner, right? So how do you regulate it? Well, that's what this business is like. This music thing, you know, 
People wonder, you know, when I get a big award or a, or a new thing happens that comes along in my life that's exciting, like, hey, listen, guys, I got a big tour coming up. Check my website, www.mooncat.org. I got a huge, you know, months and months worth of touring coming up. I haven't worked like that since around the time that I wrote this. That's not, I don't get excited. I get worried now. I get worried about my mental health. I get worried about whether or not I'm going to get obsessed and start getting jealous of who's got the higher time slot. I want to get to the point in my life where I'm happy for anybody receiving everything because I know what it's like to receive those things and I know that those things are just things. And in the end, they don't matter. It, what matters is your motive, what's in your heart. If what's in your heart is playing music all the time and being in this for the long game and making some friends and practicing and getting better at your instrument and that's a lifelong obsession that you don't ever want to stop doing, then this is for you. If you're thinking about you know, festivals and touring and sitting at home all day and not doing anything and you think that you're going to be the number one star, good luck, good luck. I've seen it happen for a few. Could be you next. But you'll probably find out it's not what you thought it was. In the end, all that glitters ain't gold. Half the story has never been told. <laughs> so now you see the light. Stand up for your right. Peace out.